higher impact, where we're motivating you toward bigger, greater, and better. I'm your host, Teresa Harrison. Thanks for tuning in. Post-pandemic life is a growing reality, and as the United States is moving toward herd immunity, we're seeing life return to normal. However, it's a new normal because there are a lot of things that have changed us, hopefully for the better. During the pandemic, most of us had an opportunity to spend time with family, with God, and with ourselves. We were, we were able to reprioritize and reevaluate. Some of us said goodbye to loved ones, and all of us realized that tomorrow is not promised. And as we move forward, we know that Romans 8.28 is right. All things work together for good to them that love God and to them that are the called according to his purpose. Tonight, we'll talk to two guests who are impacting lives outside the four walls of the church. Adria Kitchens is a Black woman whose son was falsely accused, and the family spent nearly a year in the legal system before they could prove their son's innocence. Now, Adria is helping to reshape the landscape for major corporations and institutions as it relates to anti-racist policies in America. We'll also talk to Pastor Tim Finley, who hopes to soon become Mayor Finley, the mayor of Louisville, Kentucky. Pastor Finley already had a strong political consciousness, but after the Breonna Taylor killing, he decided to shift gears and pursue public office. But first, let's visit with Jason Claiborne, who signed a major record deal just before everything was shutting down for the pandemic. But God's timing is perfect, and his new release, God Made It Beautiful, is finally slated to drop. Uh, we've been waiting through a whole pandemic. The album has been sitting for about a year and a half, so I'm actually ready to, to work on something new, but I'm so glad that everybody's able, gonna be able to um, hear this body of work. Uh, you're, gonna, you're gonna love it. No skips from one to 13. Uh, I know a lot of people are putting out EPs, but I want to put it out. I wanted to put out a whole body of work and uh, give everybody an opportunity to get to know me as an artist. Okay. So I'm excited about that. So we know that we know we've known you as a composer before, and this whole artistry thing. How did you decide to make that leap? Well, um, I mean, I've been in it. I've put out four albums, independent as an independent artist, and um, it was just waiting on my time and my moment, you know, um, for this moment to be. Uh, and I said, God, I told God, I said, God, you're funny how you would get me signed right before a pandemic and then shut everything down. So I haven't really been able to go Look out and minister now. that much. Yes. We're coming yeah, out. Yeah. About you are on top. We're of coming you. out. Yep. So what is it? Let's go back because I know that when you compose songs, it's a different mindset than when you're an artist. But now that you kind of are doing both, um, what are you trying to accomplish? Um... More, more, more than anything, I haven't changed my formula. I, I, um, I always try to make sure that the word of God is evident in every song that I write because that's where the power lies. I really, really, um, I've always took that mindset from the Walter Hawkins and the Donna Lawrences and the Andre Crouches and 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 the Ryan Winans and the Winans to make sure that the word is evident in your music because that's what's gonna stand when we leave this earth. And um, so I, I've always done that. I've never searched or ran for um, somebody to do my material, which yeah. is incredible. Um, I'm, as a writer, I have not had to go say, oh my God, I need you to do a song. It's been, this is what God gave me. Do you like it? Yeah. <laughs> and either you like it or you don't, that does not mean I can't put it out on my own as an artist. You've had a lot of success with songs. Tell me some of the people and songs that you've had out there. Oh, wow. Um, Bashan Mitchell, uh, I Worship You and Over and Over, featuring Kim Burrell on his Promises album. Um, You're All I Need, feature, uh, well, now featuring Bishop Hayes, but he made the song popular on the Sold Out album, Better by Bishop Hayes, uh, which won me these awards back here in the back. Right. Um, yeah, and um, uh, I Survived It by Ricky Dillard. Um, Lisa knows great big God, Wes Morgan's God will get me through. And I just been honored to have songs that have been in the top 20 for the last uh, 20 to 30, you know, uh, top 30 for the last, maybe uh, the last five or six years. I've had at least three songs in the top 20 on Billboard. 
Amazing. Congratulations. Thank you. God is good. Now that the pandemic has kind of subsided, will you be touring? Will you guys be going out to um, kind of do uh, the promotion? Yeah, most definitely. Um, my choir, I push them, not push them, but the majority of them are fully vaccinated. And um, uh, which I just think that is important if we're going to get out, start uh, being able to kind of get back to some type of normalcy. So um, I just encourage all young people, young adults, um, all my choir members are young adults. So I encourage them to majority of them are getting vaccinated. Some of them are holistic, but I'm still kind of saying, hey, look, in order for us to get back to doing um, uh, getting back out, I think it's very important. So, yes, we will be doing some virtual tours and some live uh, things. We actually have a big live event coming up in Cincinnati. And so the, the release is what date? The actual date? The actual album drops on 528, um, 528 that, that at midnight on Thursday night, midnight going, you'll get the whole record. Um, and then on 528, the album release concert, you'll get to see us live so you can get to know our ministry live. Uh, and then your All I Need music video will be out on 530. So how can someone see the 528 event? Uh, everybody can go to um, our sister, uh, Valika B, Chosen, uh, Set Apart and Chosen on Facebook, live on my page, Jason Claiborne, second page, and on Jason Claiborne and the Atmosphere Changes page. And you can watch the whole concert. We have some church, too, with nobody in the room. So I can't wait for you all to see it. So now I know that a lot of the, you know, the past that we did pre-pandemic was, you know, we always wanted to be in that room with people and feel, you know, all the, the stuff that we feel when we do, you know, worship. But this whole new thing of being online and, and you know, Clubhouse and uh, streaming and all of that, how has that changed your presentation of the gospel in song? Um, it really has taught me um, to really focus on my personal relationship with God. And I think that that is the key to tapping into uh, God's presence being in the room. Uh, um, and, you know, it talks about where two or three are gathered in his name, he's in the midst. So if we're all on one accord, it doesn't take a room full of people for God to come in. Uh, and I think that you really had to tap in your, uh, into your personal relationship with God in this, in this season to make people feel a part of, yes. the, of the virtual. That's really good. So now I know gospel music has changed. Gospel artistry has changed. Is it still ministry or is it mostly industry? Oh, um, wow. Yeah, we've been talking about this a whole lot. I think that there are a remnant of people that still believe that ministry is first. Um, and I pray, my prayer is that everybody through the pandemic caught on to the fact that it's ministry than industry because he set everybody down. Wow. Um, I, I said three things in this pandemic. He got you back to him, got you back to the black family and being back to family. Uh, and then it made you work on your relationship, you know, with God and the others around you. And so I pray, my prayer has been that the industry would understand that it's ministry than industry. That's great. That's really good. What is your favorite song on this new project? Ooh, oh, wow. Um, I would have to say there's a song called Send Me. Uh, and then uh, there's a song, we did a benediction song called Peace, Grace, and Mercy. Okay. And the lyrics say, may the peace of God be on your life. Uh, uh, and his grace cover you for the rest of your life. May his mercy, it's the word of God, um, follow you. We decree peace, grace, and mercy over your life. So I'm um, a little Richard Smallwood feel on this song. I love it. All right. Well, yes. we're excited and wish you the best with this entire project and all that you are doing for so many in the industry who look up to you and uh, you're doing a great job. God bless. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Harrison. And thank you for allowing me to be here with you today.
I think it is one of the tragedies of our nation, one of the shameful tragedies, that 11 o'clock on Sunday morning is one of the most segregated hours, if not the most segregated hours in Christian America. Uh, I definitely think the Christian church should be integrated, and any church that uh, stands against integration and that has a segregated body is standing against the spirit and the teachings of Jesus Christ and it fails to be a true witness. Uh, but this is something that the church will have to do itself. I don't think church integration will come through uh, legal processes. I might say that my church is not a segregating church. It's segregated, but not segregating. It would welcome white members. Next guest is Adria Kitchens from Out of Hand Theater. This company has one of the most innovative and unique approaches to anti-racist behavior. They actually use brief theatrical presentations to illustrate the race-based problems in society, especially in corporate America, followed by a discussion that often leads to meaningful change. We are doing something very, very interesting and unique. Tell us about what the work you're doing. Oh, well, wonderful. I'm glad you invited me to talk about that. So um, we're doing some work. We have an initiative called Equitable Dinners. It's one of our programs. It's a collaborative program with the um, National Center for Civil and Human Rights, the King Center Partnership for Southern Equity, um, both and partners. There are a myriad of other, <laughs> of other partners, including Atlanta Public Schools, that we are, that are community partners. Um, in this in, around the city of Atlanta, because most of the partners are, are located here. Uh, and what we want to do is to inspire anti-racism action through courageous conversation and art. And we bring people together uh, in a conversation about uh, anti-racism uh, and inequities uh, that's launched by a short play at the beginning. And right now we're doing that online due to COVID, the COVID pandemic. And hopefully starting in June, 2020, uh, June, January, 2022, we will be back live uh, and having dinner in people's homes or outside or wherever we can gather together and, and start talking to each other in person again. And what are the goals of your presentations? Um, well, the first thing would be to really build connection, right? Because one of the, one of the, um, one of the ways we we continue inside of the system of racism is to separate people. So we want to build connections, build community. We want people to be aware of the inequities that exist. Uh, we want to inspire people to take an action. Uh, and we want to, in, you know, in many ways, help to educate them and really touch them uh, in their hearts yeah. and not and in their minds, right? So that they can um, start to hopefully see that there is there is a problem and actually feel like they have some of the tools to get started to start to shift to shift what's happening in our culture because we want to dismantle the system systemic racism that's great dismantling systemic racism so how did you get involved in this work and did you start the company i did not i did not so um well it's kind of a, a longer story <laughs> that I can share. Um, I think for most of my life, I was very, um, very focused on gender equity. So that was my, that was my thing. I grew up in a very traditionally Christian home and I could never figure out why women could, you know, why they couldn't lead, why they had to be submissive. And so that didn't work for me. <laughs> and, uh, and so that was like my, my real passion. I think having kids, uh, kind of added to that, that I realized I have three brown children in a world that um, could possibly harm them. And so several years ago, um, we ended up having to go through the juvenile justice system with my son. Uh, he was um, accused of a crime at school and we spent 10 months in the DeKalb County juvenile justice system. Uh, we actually proved he didn't do what he was accused of. In fact, the complainants uh, ended up uh, admitted to lying on the stand, and yet his case was not dismissed. The judge would not dismiss his case. It took another three months. Uh, and at, even after his case was dismissed, then she held him back so she could tell him that, well, I really wanted to put you in jail today because I didn't like the way your hair was cut. Oh my so, you know, I'm, 
and I think, you know, as a mother, I was devastated because I'm thinking, you know, is this what really happens? So a lot, I think a lot of, it was a lot of disillusionment, right? A lot of things came up, like I thought people were interested in the truth and they're really not in our system of justice. Uh, I realized that every time we were there, the only people I saw were all black and brown, unless I was on the traffic court floor. That was the only time you saw any diversity <laughs> in ethnicity or race, and that troubled me. Um, I recognized that my son had the privilege of having two parents who knew attorneys, had the money to pay for an attorney. You know, although we're divorced, we came together, whole family came together to make sure he had representation. And I realized that so many of the kids and parents that I saw down there did not. Yeah. And that's what it, it really was that was, I sat there saying, what can I do? Yeah. And so that's when, I think that's when, you know, the universe God opens up all these doors <laughs> when you put the question out there. And I met um, Dr. Deidre Hawkins, who's on our Equitable Dinners design team. And I started working with her and the dinner model we use, the foundation of it is a model that she worked on with um, the founder of the Chicago dinners uh, during her dissertation. And so, you know, being out of hand and when we all came together to do our Decatur dinners uh, in 2019, we added this component of the play to it to use the art to ground, ground the conversation. So that's how I came into it. And then in last year I joined uh, out of hand theater to support having these dinners live. And we ended up in a pandemic, <laughs> but that's okay. We're still having dinners and still bringing people together virtually. So uh, diversity and uh, inclusion and anti-racism, um, those are great platforms. How do you see this being um, integrated into a program from a black church or not? <laughs> Well, I think it should be integrated into a program at a black church. I'm in a, I grew up in a black church. I'm still at a black church, okay. um, very much involved in my church. And I think we as um, black people need to be having this conversation, especially in the church. Uh, so, you know, for me, it's like, if anybody can support figuring this out, it should be the church, yes. right? That's, you know, we are, we're inside of this mindset that we're supposed to love and care for our brothers and sisters and um and forgiveness and redemption um and yet it seems like we're the farthest apart you know in in this conversation not necessarily within black people but within the church you know overall uh, overall but you know i think in the black church these are the conversations we need to be having we need to be um talking about the you know some of the solutions I think that's where that's where it started, right? This is where <laughs> this is where we've always come together in the Black Church, even um, you know, for even during times of slavery. You know, if you read and look back and you see how the church, how Black people, even though it wasn't our main religion at the time, how we use the church to bring ourselves together, to organize, to support each other. Uh, so, so many, so many ways in the black church, I think we can, we need to talk about a lot of different things about our own belief systems, where they came from, uh, and what, what it is we really can do in dismantling these systems because we have a role to play as well. Gospel Today, it was the number one magazine for the urban Christian. You gave everybody an opportunity to really open up the magazine and be proud to say, man, I will never forget Teresa Harrison and everything that she did to make sure that the gospel music industry was presented in a light that was both professional and that was also uh, life-changing for those who would read it. Get the new book that tells this incredible story at bookstoliveby.com. Over the last year, many African Americans have been affected by police violence. There have been marches, meetings, and webinars to discuss the appropriate actions to take both among leaders and members of the community. But in the city of Louisville, Kentucky, one young man, Pastor Tim Finley, isn't just talking the talk, he's walking the walk. Tell me, why did you decide that you as a pastor should now run for mayor. I know the Breonna Taylor incident happened right there in your backyard. So is that the uh, catalyst or what happened? 
You know, actually, I have been considering uh, this road, this journey for, for some time. I, I talked with friends and family, and most of them knew that this was coming. But 2020 with Breonna Taylor and the, uh, the unrest that we saw, um, a lot of the injustice that we saw even in our own city, um, even after that, it really, really solidified for me that, that now is the time to, to take that step. So tell me from a biblical standpoint, because you're a man of God and um, what, I know that there's a, a priest and, and ruler relationship, but how do you kind of reconcile that with what you're doing? Well, I think when it comes to the political arena, um, you know, I've been, I've been in the protest movement, still in the protest movement. And for me, um, and many God-fearing, Bible-believing, Jesus followers, we know that we were given a command that to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul, um, and then to love your neighbor as yourself. Um, and the fight for justice is for there to be equity, equality, love for one another, that that everyone has the right opportunity, the given opportunity to, um, to live that life um, free from oppression. Th that's, to me, a, a ultimately Christian point of view. Well, being in the protest movement, being in the street, protesting, doing all these wonderful things, you know, that's the first step. But for me, I understand that if there's going to be that real um, justice reality, then I've got to get into those rooms where policies are being made. Um, I've got to be in that in that place where decisions are being made. And again, I think that when you read, whether it's Isaiah, uh, whether you read in the Psalms, there's always that command, seek justice, seek justice, seek. And this is what this is really all about. Um, it's not only seeking justice, but it's being able to bring my faith, uh, a moral and spiritual foundation um, in a way that affects millions of people. Wow, thank you. So finally, I know that there are a number of people who are politically astute that are Christians. Um, not every pastor wants to run for public office, not every Christian wants to run for public office, but as you say, the, the job and the attention of every Christian should be tuned in to justice for all. Um, why don't you leave mm -hmm. us some final words, give us a message of encouragement. I would say not only have black and brown communities, especially black communities, been disenfranchised by policies and the lack of resources. Um, I think we have to go deeper than that. We've also been, we've been disenfranchised theologically, um, that a lot of our um, view of scripture was shaped by a Eurocentric ideology. I think when we look at theology in the right lens and look at it through the lens of Jesus Christ, we come to find out that there's no place for complicity. There's no place to be violent. That we've always been taught to, we've always been shown in scripture to speak out. We talk about learning to do good, seeking justice, correcting oppression, um, bringing justice to the fatherless. That was there in Isaiah. We talk about Job and we always talk about how he was blameless and he was. But he goes on to explain why he was blameless in, in the book of Job. He talks about, I wore justice like a turban, that I broke the jaw of the oppressor, that he made it his, his life, life's work to do good by other people. And I think in this westernized Eurocentric theology that we've been given, we think it's about church on Sunday, going home, staying out of all that other stuff, and saying, well, we have no, no reason to be involved in politics. If politics are affecting the lives of people, if politics and policy are keeping disenfranchised people in a place of poverty, why wouldn't we be involved in politics? If we're talking about that, um, whether it's through housing, look at the, the pain, every Dr. Fauci, every single credible medical professional has said the reason why black people died at two and a half times the rate as you know, talking about COVID-19 was because of healthcare inequities. What are those healthcare inequities? It all goes back to policy. It all goes back to this, pro all of these things. So we can't on one hand say, oh, that's terrible, that's a shame, and then refuse to get involved in the, the political 
uh, sort of conversation that's around many of these statutes that are con constantly hurting people. So again, I believe that for every person who may be watching this, um, it is your spiritual duty to know what's going on around you. It is your spiritual duty to know what your legislator is doing, what your legislator stands for. And it's your spiritual duty as a, as a God-fearing, Holy Ghost-filled believer to say, I was put on this earth to do more than just shout. I'm here to champion Christianity. I'm here to, to bring my faith into every sector. And that's what I'm doing. People say, well, are you going to stop pastoring? Absolutely not. Are you going to tone down when you get in, in, in the office? Absolutely not. I'm going to bring me, Jesus. I'm bringing all of this to that role because that's what we need in this world. Thanks for spending time with me this evening. Please make sure to order my new book, Unstoppable, at bookstoliveby.com. It's all about my journey with Gospel Today magazine, and it will absolutely bless you and inspire you to be unstoppable. Well, and also please connect with me online at Dr. T. Dr. T. Hairston or at TeresaHairston.com. Well, that's it for tonight. Be sure to go online and get your copy of Jason Claiborne's new release, God Made It Beautiful. And here's one of my favorite song from his, songs from his new release, You're All I Need. Thank you for breathing through us. Oh.